Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in to Border City Rock Talk. We get great news, great interviews, great interviewees with sometimes a comedic touch. Make sure you hit the subscribe button, the notification bell. Coming up this week, I have Jack Russell of Great White Fame, and I've got Jeff Tate. I've got Jeff Tate. My very first rock interview five years ago was a phoner with Jeff, so make sure you subscribe so you don't miss that. If you're uh, wondering why the last two interviews, um, I haven't had a um, sort of a virtual background, it's because um, my head gets wobbly. And I've decided to get myself a, a collapsible green screen. So they're, I'm about 80 bucks short. They're 80 bucks. So if you want to send a, a any transfer, Ernest Skinner, 2671 at yahoo.com, feel free. And obviously I'm joking, but if money comes in, I won't be joking to not take it. Before I keep on rambling here, I've got the great Gordy Johnson of Big Sugar. How are you doing? I got a chihuahua on my chest and a peacock on my shoulder so i how could i be doing any better and you've got uh you got a rooster on your head i mean you're you're sporting that look for what how 40 years now uh no this was i had this hair going in the 80s you know that was timely um and it just over covid my my kids found photos of me online with the mohawk going on and everybody thought that was very funny. Look at these funny photos we found of young Papa. So I <laughs> went to the bathroom and shaved it all up and went, ta-da, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Do, you, uh, do you ever get um, old lady running from you in grocery stores? Uh, no, actually, you'd be, you'd be amazed how many. Uh, it's a good conversation starter here in Central Texas. You know, when you... <laughs> You go into a gas station with this on your head. Somebody will say something. They're usually friendly. I get more smiles than anything. It's fun being the only rock star dad at the at the high school basketball game, too. I was just going to say that because I bet you uh, when you're walking away, there's people saying, look at that guy trying to be a rock star. And then somebody says, he is a rock star. You know, my daughter, she, we go to, like I said, high school basketball game. She's like, no, no, you're not wearing a hat. <laughs> you can't wear that. You'd wear one of those uh I don't know, they're called flat 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 hats. Um interviewed Mark Kendall the other day and they're they're very common. They're um you see them in in England, but they're or Ireland, but they're popular now. I think you could sport a flat hat on that, but or maybe one of those uh university graduate things. You know those square <laughs> things? The little thing the tassels. First I'll have had to have gone to university anyway. Anyway. So, um, yeah, so thanks for uh, taking this interview. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware. Um, years ago, um, I'd set you up with uh, the Western Standard. Um, I forget his name now. He's going to shoot me. But um, Fildebrandt, Derek Fildebrandt, the owner of the Western Standard. You guys did a live YouTube thing where I was supposed to be involved. I set oh, it up, right. but I oh, couldn't I get online for that. I remember that. Yeah, yeah, that was during COVID. Yeah, yeah. And you're both. doing the praying mantis thing because you couldn't hear him, and you and you do your praying mantis uh, imitation for us. <laughs> you're um. You were just recently mentioned by um one of the best guitar players in the world, to Mr. Joe Satriani. What did you think about that? That was pretty crazy. Joe Satriani talking about me in the same breath as Eddie Van Halen. But we should clarify because, you know, what Eddie Van Halen and I have in common is that uh, we both prefer to eat pizza with a knife and fork. Just a little rock and roll trivia for you. That's where we get compared most often. Well, actually, I, that makes sense, too. Do you eat your Snickers bar with a knife, knife and fork like Mr. Pitt? No, nah, I don't eat Snickers bars. Oh, okay. <laughs> Not a big candy guy. So getting back to Joe, um, he talked about um, you guys, um, you know, our, our, our colleagues and friends, and uh, he thinks you're one of the, the the great guitar players out there. How would you describe your style? I kind of look at your playing as kind of a, it's a fat style in the way that, um, the way you have your distortion and your, um, and your audio setup, you use a lot of finger picking and, um, and, and slide. Slide is definitely um, something that you're known for. Where do you think you um, got your influences or who influenced you? And um, how would you describe your guitar playing style? If I describe myself as one of the great guitar players, somebody slapped me, first of all. Because <laughs> I'm, 
I'm not that egotistical. But um, I don't know, man. I guess it's just, you know, for any musician, you sort of become the sum total of all your influences. And for me, um, I just have a very diverse set of influences. Yeah, I mean, there are some guys who... They love Stevie Ray Vaughan, and from Stevie Ray Vaughan, they got into Jimi Hendrix, and that's as far as they got. And they got so deep into those two cats. Then, of course, they're playing sounds like that. They play a Stratocaster, and they got music notes on their strap, and that's all they do, and that's what they sound like. But that's already been done. I, I don't see any point in, in rehashing that. I mean, I love Jimmy, and I love Stevie, but... I listen to Charlie Mingus and Jaco Pastorius and Art Blakey and Sonny Rollins and Louis Armstrong. None of those guys are guitar players, you'll notice. You know what I mean? Elvin Jones and uh, reggae music, a very deep well of reggae music, Leroy Sibbles and the Heptones and early 80s dance hall records. And do you know what I mean? I, I, I listen to such a wide variety of other things. It all slips under my fingers and comes out sounding like, like me. I mean, I love some open tune slide guitar, folk blues, Charlie Patton, stuff like that. I love that stuff too, but that's never been the only, you know, if I was playing that kind of a song, I would also probably reference Louis Armstrong or Earl Hines or, you know, Fats Domino. That all still comes out in, in whatever I'm doing. I never sit down to play a Robert Johnson song and stick to the script. Like, I've got to somehow recreate Robert Johnson. I'm like, well, Robert Johnson wasn't thinking like that. Why would I think like that? So I just, yeah. it's never been my mission to, uh, to recreate anybody else's thing that they did. I'd let myself be influenced by it and, and just, try to come by it all naturally and let it just be part of the flow. You know, I've never been a, like I said, I've never been first to try to recreate something. Yeah. You're, you're kind of um, alluding to, um, well, directly alluding to something I've never thought about, but you're saying that guitarists, you listen to the more guitarists, you get more of your own sound because as Adrian Vandenberg once told me, you get a little, you take a mark or a little piece of everybody you listen to and that makes your overall style. But you're kind of also in saying that um, just listening to music, even singers, even a rhythm, even a beat is something that you kind of incorporate subconsciously in your in your guitar playing. I think there's more Art Blakey in my guitar playing than there is Jimi Hendrix, for example, just as an ingredient. Love Jimi Hendrix, loved him since I was a kid. But there's something about Art Blakey, who's a drummer, if you don't, for those who don't know, one of the greatest jazz drummers, there's a lyricism and there's a thing about Blakey's drumming. It swings so hard and it's always so inventive and like vocal. I don't have no other way to describe it. It's not like stuff you could transcribe almost. It's just like somebody talking through a jazz drum kit. That That's had a bigger influence on me. Now, it's not like you can listen to one of my records and hear my guitar playing and go, oh yeah, I hear, I hear Art Blakey in that. I'm just telling you, that's one of the, that's why I approach rhythm the way I do, the way I approach the construction of a, of a solo, as opposed to someone who sat and practiced finger tapping and listened to Van Halen until they can recreate that note for note. That's, you know what I mean? I don't know. It just, to me, listen, if you only, if you're a guitar player who only listens to guitar players, that's like, the cooking equivalent of saying, well, what goes good with chocolate? Oh, I know, more chocolate. How about some white chocolate? How about some dark chocolate and some milk chocolate and some chocolate? And we'll put that on a chocolate brownie. Okay, good. I like chocolate too. But, you know, something that has a little more complexity to the ingredients you borrow from different, you know, flavors. And, and you know, that's, that's the only analogy I can, that makes sense to me. It's like I try to, include more ingredients in the thing. I just think it makes you sound more unique. But I do love some Tony Iom. Yeah, Black Sabbath, you can't go wrong. Um, now, let's talk about um, some news here. You're going on a run starting in, um, is it March you start the uh, run? Just tell us about that run. 
and the re-release? Uh, we're actually starting at the end of February in Western Canada. Um, we are going all the way across Canada. Hopefully, you know, in the coming months, there are more dates being added that will be announced shortly. Um, recently, it came to our attention that Jack White had been a fan of 500 pounds. He saw Big Sugar back in that era. And his people got in touch with us and said they would like to do a vinyl reissue of 500 pounds, which kind of blew our minds and opened up a world of possibilities for what we could do to present a show. So to be able to go out and play that entire record and make a set, you know, it's a two set night. So people get all the, the hits and all the jams that they love in the second set. But that first set will play the entire record uh, on vintage instruments and amps from that era that we still have. And, um, you know, I haven't, that's a, that's a younger version of Gordy Johnson creating and playing all that music. So for me to revisit that record in its entirety and breathe new life into the stuff, it's, it's very interesting. It's been super inspiring as a, as a musician to, approach your earlier work and, and we're not a note for note kind of a band i've never done that anyway so it's not like i'm trying to learn the songs note for note it's just trying to find a creative relevance in in older compositions a lot of which we haven't played even back in the day I, i'm not sure we played all the songs on the record when we played live um that's um that's really big these days. I've noticed in the last couple three two or three years, Gordy is there's um a lot of and one of the ones that speaking of Jeff Tate, um I think I first noticed that um in the last three years, um bands going out or artists going out and playing an entire album. Jeff was doing that uh, three or four years ago with um Empire and Operation Mindcrime. And to think about it, you really have to put it into context. Some of those albums are super long, like you're doing two sets. They're that long, so. Well, 500 Pounds isn't a very long record, though. That's, you know, in the early 90s, there was a lot more jazz and blues influence in our music. Um, it's not a particularly long record, but we've also infused that with songs that we were playing live in that era, different jams that we used to go into, songs that influenced other songs. So we're able to make a pretty interesting uh historical perspective uh look at the record and the things that went into the record okay sense. okay i see what you're saying so you're going to be doing the whole album but you're going to be putting in a few um pieces in the set yeah so um, there's some you know it took some research but trying to find songs that we used to play you know within the context of another song what's a song that influenced this song oh i see Stuff we played on tour that wasn't on the record, but when we were on tour promoting 500 Pounds the first two times, um, songs that we would have played in the set at that time. So, yeah. Okay, it's, it's like it's going to be like a history lesson almost for you. Yeah, well, it was for us. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you moved down to Texas. Um, when was that? You've been down there, what, 20 years, 30? Yeah, yeah, about 20 years. Okay, what, what made you move to Texas? I spoke to John Albany. He's in Nashville. He was Lee Aaron's guitarist and NAS, NASCAR. Or he was um he was driving um cars down there. But what um what got you to to leave um the 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 warm climate of Canada for Texas? Uh I mean, yeah, climate it, that seems like an obvious one, but it was more the culture, just food, music everything about it really just the music that's come out of texas has always been a a big influence on me so it had sort of been a an ambition of mine to to get in here and 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 be a part of it you know and just be a part of the continuum of the music that's come out here i mean it's it's obvious enough to say texas music and here we are talking about guitar players you know Stevie Ray Vaughan looms pretty large over the whole thing, but uh, you don't have to dig very deep to realize that you got everyone from, you know, Bob Wills, Willie Nelson, Waylon Jennings made a name for himself here. Uh, 
you know, just that Doug Song, um, ZZ Top. Well, speaking of around uh, T Bone Walker, Lowell Folsom, like Charlie Christian, you go <laughs> just for guitar players alone, Lead Belly. It's, you know, it, it's a pretty deep well of music, not to, mm -hmm. that doesn't even touch on the Tejano side of things, the Mexican culture and influence in, in the music as well. Yeah, I love Mexico, and so definitely, um, yeah, I can see that same with um, New Mexico and Arizona. But uh, speaking of um, people that came from Texas, indirectly, a Canadian band, they got their big start from Texas, Triumph. They were um, featured on radio station down there. forget the name of the show, but they had heard some of Triumph's early stuff, and they were playing it so much that Rick Emmett will tell you that's how they made it and got it on the map internationally it was through Texas. I think Rush also had a Rush as well. They had a big, uh, they had pretty good success here before it caught on here before a lot of other places. I have friends who saw them in San Antonio, yeah, on the Caress of Steel tour or something, and they were already like everyone in town had to go. Like you got to see these guys. This is before twenty and twelve. You know, everybody still you had to go see Rush. At, Randy's and sent to me. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, I won't keep you much longer. You've been gracious and um hope everybody enjoyed. Well, I know everybody enjoyed that little guitar look you sent us. Um where was I going with this? Frig oh damn it, damn it, damn it, damn it, damn it, damn it. I don't know where I was going with this, Scorty. It was something so very intelligent about, I was gonna ask you. We're talking about Texas. No, it wasn't it was about Texas music and the history of it. No, no, it was something way out of there. Um, I don't know, maybe it was something like Grady. Was that named after the Sanford Son character? <laughs> no? No, okay. I think that was, well, funnily enough, uh, I suspect that that was a, a nickname I got on tour. And that, yeah, it did have something to do with that, I think. Did and it then, really? Uh, it did. And then by the time we, you know, because in the tour bus, I just like, shuffle around like an old man and... <laughs> Just always be bitching and complaining. So that, yeah, that, that sort of. Yeah, that I don't know. Humor I came into it. But then when when we came down here, I'd already been toting that nickname around a little bit. So that just became the name of the band. Uh, that's awesome, man. That's awesome. I don't know what I was thinking anyways. Um, obviously, it wasn't that important. Uh, I'd like to thank you for your time. Uh, what's the opposite of unsubscribe, Gordy? The opposite of unsubscribe. Subscribe. Yeah, everybody Re doing this. Gordy Johnson of Big Sugar says, subscribe to the channel for these great interviews. Uh, down below in the links is going to be um, all the shows um, that uh, Bigger Sugar is going to be doing, as well as you can check out um, all the information, buy some merch. And um, yeah, I thank you very much for your time, Gordy. Good talking to you. All right, thanks, man. All right, y'all, I'm Gordy Johnson, and Ernest asked me to uh, demonstrate for y'all how to play the riff from Dig in a Hole. Now, I've seen a bunch of examples of this on the internet, YouTube, and what have you, and they're all wrong. Uh, the worst, the first thing, the worst thing you can do, I'm trying to play it in standard tune, never been done, never played it in standard tuning, it'd be really hard to go. What you want to do is you take your six string guitar this is in standard tuning go gibson j45 and we're going to put in open g tuning right so you can get there by uh finding your strings that stay the same like your your d your g and your b are going to stay the same you want to tune your a string down to g tuning your E string down to D. And you want to tune your high E string to D. Ah! Now you're in open G, but GJ, it's in the key of A. Ah! And you take the capo. <laughs> Suddenly... 
gonna sound like digging a hole. open strings for you.